Now for today's program. Letty Cotton Pogrebin is a writer and social justice activist. She is a founding editor of Ms. Magazine and has served as a Moment columnist for more than 30 years. Her articles and op-eds have appeared in dozens of periodicals, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Nation. Letty is the author of 12 books, including Deborah, Golda, and Me, Being Female and Jewish in America, and Shonda, A Memoir of Shame and Secrecy. Joining Letty today is Sarah Brieger, Moment Magazine's editor and director of Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Letty Cotton Pogrebin and Sarah Brieger. Thank you. Um, thank you, Suzanne, for organizing this. Um, and a big thank you to Letty for, for being here today. I'm glad to be with you. Um, the, the column in the latest issue of Moment that you wrote, I think, captures a lot of what American Jews are going through right now. You know, the grief, the fear, the agony, the agonizing. Um, but the framework of the piece is how you're switching the personal is political. And now for Jews, the political is personal. And I'm curious, what do you mean by that? Well, when I cut my teeth on the women's movement, the personal is political was one of the most resonant slogans that sort of made me feel seen and understood because so much in our lives played out in the in the political landscape in one way or another. I mean, whether it was, you know, debt policy or environmental policy or hunger or, or anything that affected uh, people and families and kids, you know, the personal uh, had its incarnation in legislation, litigation and, and economic status. Now, I was realizing that the meaning of that in my life right now was exactly the opposite. I was taking everything personal. Instead of kind of looking at the, you know, flowering out to the magna, the, the, the big view, I was taking the big view and it was agonizing me and it was giving me nightmares. And also the personal is political yielded action. It yielded uh, advances, progress, measurable, palpable in our lives, you know, suddenly women could get credit cards and suddenly women didn't have to have their, fa their fathers or husbands sign their leases and all kinds of things. And there were no longer, you know, help wanted male, help wanted female, big changes, you know, not to mention women judges and women, women cops and everything else in the, in the, in the everyday life of all of us. But in terms of this, it became, it burrowed into me, my spirit. <laughs> it depressed me. It despaired me. I was on it all the time. And so I sort of deconstructed it and tried to understand, you know, what's at stake here and how, I mean, I'm going to be 85 on my next birthday. I was eight, almost nine in 1948. I grew up with the state. I grew up in a hyper Zionist household. My father was out almost every night at, you know, meetings, raising money um, for the issues, the original settlements, and then for the state itself, and then first for the Haganah, and then for the IDF. I mean, it was in my mother's milk and in the air. Um, and and my rabbis and Hebrew school teachers had inculcated me with that Jewish values that were suddenly so challenged by what was going on, because at that point, the Israeli airstrikes had begun and the death toll had risen precipitously. And quite frankly, I was afraid and ashamed at the same time. I was worried and horrified and sad. Of course, at the same time, my husband's been very sick, so that's all played into it as well. It seems like everything I care about was crashing, crashing. And I thought, what well, you know, what can I make of this? And so the moment column sort of tracks that trail, that line of thought, and ends with the fact that when the political is personal, maybe the solution is personal. Maybe we have to get into the act in a much bigger way. We can't just watch. And, um, you know, I, I'm a little bit um, concerned that the Jewish collective has become so self-centered on anti-Semitism in Israel that we've lost our allies. So we're feeling very alone. You know, again, I grew up in a time when the Black Jewish Alliance was just a given. 
You knew that we were going to march together. You knew that we were going to mourn together and celebrate together. And of course, that's completely gone. I'm, I when, won't... when you say self self-centered, what, what do you mean? I mean, we looked at only our own service. Uh -huh. We were no longer creating alliances, working across class, race, you know, ethnicity to make America more responsive to minorities' rights and, and everything that affected all of us. We were in cahoots. Now we're in conflict. And this is deeply painful to me because I spent 10 years in Black Jewish dialogue and I thought, you know, that's the way to go. You talk, you meet, you work together, you solve problems, and you're much bigger than your individual minority group. In solidarity, there is strength. That's the old union slogan. So that's a kind of short form of what was sort of obsessing me and still is. I think some people, um, or at least some Jews have said, you know, they feel like, you know, they haven't felt solidarity from, you know, their allies or their minority groups who they have stood up for. Um, have you experienced that at all? Well, that's my point exactly, mm -hmm. is that, that we've lost that. And that's partly our fault. You know, it's partly because we changed. I mean, just to look at one major Jewish organization, American Jewish Committee, I was working all the time there on intergroup relations. I don't think that department exists. If it does, it certainly doesn't have a high profile. So it's partly our fault. We, we, we turned inward. Even it, during a period when anti-Semitism was not like it is today. So it's kind of unfortunate that we only wanted to talk about and have conferences about anti-Semitism in Israel. And now, you know, we're paying the piper because the, the commonalities and solidarity is, is so diminished that we, and how I feel about the women's movement kind of tracks mm. that as well, because um, sisterhood is powerful. And when you don't, when your sisters turn against you because they've made common cause with an oppressed group, because women are still basically an oppressed group, we may not, white women may not experience that, but it's certainly a reality for, for others. And so um, I'm finding myself appalled when, for example, as we discussed before, we all went online, that, um, that a a bicycling group has, has banned a woman who is an Israeli from participating on the grounds of intersectionality, the word that means all of us are connected and all of our issues ultimately are connected. And when somebody somewhere is suffering, you know, you're suffering and you've got to take a step. And so feminists are take, have taken that very seriously. And uh, whether it's heartfelt or not, they are joining forces with the people they consider most in need of support and help. And when you look at that death toll, I don't blame them. <clears throat> I mean, we have to keep two thoughts in our minds simultaneously, that we have every right to uh, want to actualize our suffering in the form of revenge, anybody would, but uh, speaking for myself and a lot of people who I talk to and who have written to me as they've read my opinions, um, we're never going to stamp out terrorism by killing children and women and children and leaving blood everywhere. We're only making new terrorists. So for a people that's supposed to have a lot of seichel, I think Israeli is, Israel, Israel is being dumb just dumb on a pragmatic, factual, concrete level. We are never going to wipe out terrorism as long as everyone that we kill has a family. Who are going to grieve? And what are they going to do with their grief? They're going to want somebody in power to, you know, make that revenge turn around and go toward Israel. I, so I, think that, yeah, I, I find this strategy... This military strategy, unsurprising coming from an ultra-right ca war cabinet, or not entirely ultra-right, but an ultra-right prime minister and his uh, his coalition, it doesn't surprise me because a chance to get Palestinians out of the way 
has been on their agenda, you know, for decades. So that's not surprising. It's the fact that we're letting that happen. We, the world's Jews, are letting that happen because of the lunacy of making more terrorists. I think, I mean, and I've had similar conversations with people and the response is always, well, what do you want Israel to do? What should Israel be doing? Um, Israel should have stood firm before the world and said, hostages for ceasefire, period. Instead of all this palaver, you know, about collateral damage that happens in every war, that communicates the worst kind of indifference and insensitivity. I'm writing a piece now about Elie Wiesel's reminder of the kind of the worst sin in is, is, is indifference. Mm -hmm. And the indifference of our community based on polls, I'm not grabbing this from, you know, a sample of six, but based on two polls, one by the Israel Dem Democracy Institute and one by a, tele a, a group of researchers at Tel Aviv University, have the most appalling results. In, in one of them, 85% of Israeli Jews believe that the military should not take it into consideration. This is right there on paper in findings of a, poll, of a public opinion poll. 85 out of 100 Israeli Jews believe that the military, the military should not take into consideration the impact on the Palestinian occupation, uh, the Palestinian population in Gaza when planning its future military actions. Not take into consideration, you know? I mean, who are we? Who are we? And then the other poll has something like 57% say were asked, do you think that the that the the, the amount of firepower firepower exploded in the in the in Gaza by the IDF is too much, you know, too little appropriate? 57 percent have said it's not enough, not enough firepower. Who are we? Well, I guess, I mean, why do you think that is? Is it a trauma response? Is it a yes. revenge response? It's a trauma response, but it's also not a considered intellectually, you know, unpackable response because of what I just said. We're not going to accomplish our goal, which is to stamp out a, a, a Hamas. We're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to consign generations from the babies on, you know, because those grieving families are never going to forget, just like we're not ever going to forget the bullet-ridden baby in the crib in 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 the in that kibbutz. But what do you do with what you're never forgetting? You don't go crazy. You don't become frenzied and hysterical and say more firepower power. You become more sensitive and sensible and human and say, look at this. We can't keep tit for tatting for the next century. You sit down and you figure out a way and you offer and you trade what really matters. Stop killing, trying to kill terrorists and ending up killing children and start saying what you really want. You want the hostages back and then you'll stop and then we'll see and maybe we'll sit down and maybe we'll negotiate. Otherwise it's permanent war. And I read now that there's so much um, fear about the northern border, and that's also crazy that we're letting them shrink our borders. I start saying our when I talk about Israel, but we're we're pushing up from the Gaza border and pushing down from the Lebanese border, and they're winning. They're shrinking Israel, and we're trying to expand and spread all over the West Bank, and now take over to make uh, settlements in Gaza, and they're shrinking us. How crazy can we be? That's Violence true. is losing land for us. Peace would be gaining security for us. I don't get it. And I and I it it makes me lose sleep every night. I don't know about the rest of you. Let's see, there's 167 people on this. They could spread out into the community and talk about all these issues in a much more constructive way, rather than just, I'm for Israel, I'm supporting Israel. We need to think about what, where's, where are we going, who are we are, and where are we going? 
Israel doesn't have an end game. Have you heard one? I haven't, and I read everything. <laughs> how how is your do you have you know how is how's your friend how's your friendships in Israel been affected? You know, a lot of people on the Israeli left, even people I consider friends, you know, have become really hawkish right now, yeah. uh, which is understandable. But I'm curious if you've experienced that and if there's a gulf that, you know, we can't go over or close. You know, it's like when your kid does a really bad thing, you, a person who never uses physical punishment could just smack him. The first impulse is smack him. And then you sit down with the kid and you reason. And you try to make sense of your behavior and the child's behavior. It's not, it's not hard. The pattern is everywhere around us. I understand that feeling. If anybody dared to hurt one of my children, the first thing I would do is like bring an ax. I mean, I, I don't know what I would do. But then I would realize, well, whoops, they might be coming from my other children. I better, I better stop and engage on this. It's, it's 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 the same it's the same paradigm. And I mean, what should American Jews be doing, um, or what can we be doing? We should be uh, pushing Biden to be tougher. He, for him to say something is over the top when you're talking about at that point, I think it was twenty seven thousand dead Palest Palestinians, forty percent of them children, by the way. You don't say it's over the top. You say, we're not going to stand for this. You say, we're thinking of conditioning aid to the human rights record of, of the Israeli government. We've got clout. If we really care about life and death and war and the proliferation of hatred and violence and the endless conflict in, in the Middle East, in that region, you say something that'll, that'll you know, what did they say? Restart the you know computer or what do you call it? You know, re do it a restart. Right. You, there's a name for it. You know, um, a reset or reset. Thank you. You do a serious reset. That that's and changing a little of the of the paradigm. I also feel I also feel that it's time for us to look at where we're giving money. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are. Uh, Israeli organizations that literally are funding the violent settlers who are who are like renegades, who are like the Wild West, who ha have guns and rifles and and they are taking, you know, security into their own hands. And very often, I'm ashamed to say the IDF is pitching in. And yet, you know, we're not looking at where our money goes. You know, when I, in all honesty, when I found out that the UJA was funding things over the green line. I stopped giving to the UJA. I gave to Federation, but not the UJA. I, I want to be responsible. I want my money to, to express my values. Um, I give to I, I I've given to Bitselem. I always give to Americans for Peace now. I always give to the, you know, I've given to uh the Israeli policy forum and, and forum and you know anything that is advancing democracy and coexistence and peace. That's that's what I want and that's what I try to support in in, in all of my decisions. And I certainly check myself on every December before the end of the year to see how did how did I do. I give myself a grade. I mean, what, what you're suggesting is changing a little bit of the paradigm that, you know, so many of us grew up with that, you know, our yeah. job is to support Israel here and we have to support kind of what they're doing because maybe we don't understand or we, you know, we're not there. We don't have a right to say anything. Right. Well, if if uh, Israel says, at the, as, as its leaders always do, that they represent the Jews of the world, you know, they represent us. We should be proud. I am proud. I couldn't be prouder of the things that Israel has accomplished, of our technological wonders, the medical research. I mean, we all know what the, the miracle is. That's the miracle. I love the miracle. I'm ashamed of the government. I'm ashamed of the government. I'm ashamed that Betsela Smojic is in charge of security, a man who was a Kahana acolyte. This is crazy. 
That's who you put in charge? No wonder the settlers have, you know, a, a blank check. And we stand by. We just we just say they know what they're doing or I shouldn't be speaking. I'm not there. Well, I have cousins there. I have relatives there. I have friends there. And I've met, I've been there 25 times and I have a lot of memories. And I don't want the whole miracle and the dream to go down the drain. I don't want to, I don't want to live. How many of these hundred and whatever people want to live having to explain why we had to kill 29,000 people, even though it's impossible to get every terrorist? You know, they've got something like, you know, 500 square miles of tunnels. We're going to find every terrorist? Please. I know the IDF is great. <laughs> and they've they talk about miracles. They have accomplished miracles in terms of defending with a small state in a not ha not friendly neighborhood. But they're not going to get every one of them. It's like trying to get all the roaches in New York. It's not possible. We've got subways. I can't help <laughs> thinking. As rats, by the way, there's another really good metaphor. Um, as, as you're talking, I can't help thinking, you know, why why don't you give up on Israel? Why should we give up on why why don't we give up on Israel if you know if we feel like there's so much negative and and shame that we feel? Why are we why are I was we born in 1939 and I remember because I was a very precocious and curious child. And one third of my mother's and father's relatives died in, in the Holocaust. And I remember when the care packages that my mother sent came back, address the unknown or whatever it was in German or whatever language. I remember that. It's scarring. I know what it's like to not have a place, not have a place to go. You know, home is a place where when you go there, Robert Frost said, I think it was Robert Frost, they have to let you in. That's kind of how I feel about Israel. Israel is my cousin. And my cousin isn't going to close the door against me no matter what. I need there to be one. So my Palestinian friends say, do you want to go to that Israel? Do you want to go and live under that government? Do you really feel safe there when they think that reforming conservative Jews aren't Jews? Well, really, that makes me stop and think. Am I going to feel that, you know, the, the the more the right wing ascends in terms of power, am I going to feel comfortable there? Or will I suddenly be treated the way I think Donald Trump is going to treat me? I mean, maybe I don't have a home. That's why I'm fighting to save it. Because I lived through that. Maybe, you know, it's harder to be this old because you went to the mountain and you had no idea that there was another side and it went down. When I sat on the White House lawn about, about 100 yards or less from Clinton, Arafat, and Rabin, I said, I can die now, you know? That's it, all my work at that point, 1993, September 11, 1993, September 13th, I said to myself, you know, done. You know, I don't have to do this labor, this labor of activism anymore. And I watch Jewish leaders and Jewish business people go over to the whatever it is, Rayburn office building after the handshake and make contracts for, you know, student exchanges and, you know, and and uh, mergers and collectives and co cooperatives. It really is acting itself out. And the Arab League ended their boycott. I said, this is the mountaintop. And then we know what happened. It started with the murder of Rabin by a Jew. Unthinkable. So that's why I, ask, I keep at it. I worry about young people because you all haven't seen what it could feel like or what it could look like. I was in Jericho when a combined <clears throat> Israeli and Palestinian police force on untangled a ridiculous traffic jam. Everybody was squished in together 
And because of Oslo, which we now <laughs> decry, these two police forces, which were doing the sort of transitional stuff, that, you know, you, you go here, you go there, they were mixing um, Hebrew and, Ara and Arabic. It was like, it was like seeing a, a brand new future. And, you know, the, the Palestinians were building a, a, a parliament in uh, Abu, Abu Gosh, I believe, it was, Abu Gosh, I think it's called. You can see it be built. And, you know, it was like, yes, we were going to divide Jerusalem. That was in, but we were not going to put up a wall. We were just going to have, it's like the, the wall between Queens and Brooklyn. You know it, you feel it. Some people want to rent in Queens, some want to rent in Brooklyn, some, you know, have a Brooklyn accent, some have an accent, and some have a different accent. You know that, but you coexist. And that's what <clears throat> that parliament building, as it went up, was, was going to represent. It was the Queens Borough Hall, and we had our Knesset. You know, we had our Brooklyn Knesset. <clears throat> you could see the future and smile. Now I see the future, and I mourn, and I'm scared. This, this relates a little to, um, I think last year, which feels like a hundred years ago, you wrote a piece about confederation and yeah. how, you know, what some, sometimes people call, um, you know, two states, one homeland. Right, exactly. Do you still feel like that's possible or something like that is possible? I think that's desirable. I can't see anything else. I'm not ever going to be a one stater. No way. Our extremes would destroy that experiment. There are always going to be <clears throat> Baruch Goldsteins and so on, and on the Palestinian side, we've seen what seen what their what their militants are capable of. So one state is crazy, but confederation has an overarching um, governmental structure that deals with things like air and water <laughs> and power you know, and environmental issues. I mean, the smoke from <clears throat> from East Jerusalem blow, blows in West Jerusalem on a bad day. So, you know, that, that sort of thing you can deal with collectively. And then we can have our Hanukkahs and our Pesachs and, our, and shut down for Shabbat or do whatever we want on our side. And our minorities will be <clears throat> honored and their rights would be guaranteed. And the same on their side. They can celebrate Ramadan, they can put up their flag, <clears throat> and they can give our uh, people who would remain there, settlements could stay. They would simply be residents rather than citizens. They would vote in Israeli elections. It's when you look at the possibilities and the plan in, in detail, of course it sounds like a dream, but you know, it, it sounded like a dream that uh, um, Sadat would go to Jerusalem. Who could ever see such a thing, you know, happening? You know, it would be pure fiction. It would be delusional. So confederation may be delusional today and practical tomorrow. And so I'm, I, I support it because someday there's got to be a tomorrow. <clears throat> we um, hope. Yeah, we hope. Yes. Um, something you mentioned um, about younger people um, and generational shifts. Yeah. Um, I mean, all the things that you said you experienced or internalized maybe, you know, cause your connection to Israel. But a lot of people I talk to who are, you know, younger than me don't feel that connection and maybe don't even and feel like even the concept of Zionism, you know, was a mistake. Exactly. And, and we've... We're, we did it. We did that to young people. How? And for years I've been writing about this wherever I could. How? By telling kids they had to be loyal and say this and say that and never allowing them to hear the other side, to sit in the room with the other, with another people who loves that land as much as we do. We can't get that into our heads. What we feel, what I feel about Israel is felt by every Palestinian I know. And how many years did it take us to get our, our place? They're never stopping. They're not leaving. They're gonna be there to the last corpse. 
because that's how we were. Look what we did to get there. So we didn't educate our children to debate. We ed ed educated our children to, you know, mouth platitudes and slogans. And we didn't give them a realistic view. We, you know, we didn't show them Benny Morris's revelations. We, ne we never said, wait a minute. Here's what Israel's founding fathers and mother, <clears throat> you know, really, really did. That we, we did, we have our own record of atrocities. It, it kills my soul to realize that we shot, we shot babies. Men, Benny Morris, when everything was allowed to be published, he, he wrote this book. Now he's <laughs> more of a right wing person, but He's a historian and he had the records and that's what we did. So, you know, it's not like everything human is, you know, excusable, but that we have done, we have done, we haven't been angels and they're not angels and they're not all the perpetrators we saw on October 7th, just like we're not all, the very few in the Haganah or whatever, who shot babies. But there, but there's a record of it. There's a record of our raping. It, 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 it scalds your eyes to see it. You can't believe it because we all were raised on these pioneers and they're so wonderful and brave. And, and the Exodus story. Yeah, the Exodus story. So young people are, what are they doing? They're turning their back on the current Israel. They don't know their history. They don't know the narrative of the other side. They can't answer the narrative of the other side if they haven't been shown it and haven't had to argue with it, grapple with it. I spent, I have spent 14 years in a, in a Palestinian Jewish dialogue. We not, haven't met Sinak since October 7th uh, because who can speak, you know, because we were, on, we were completely on a different path. But um, I know their narrative. And if I were born a Palestinian, who knows what I would be and what I would be saying and what the 160-something people here would, who Jews on this call would be saying and doing. If we knew and had those experiences, who would we be? I don't know. I mean, it does seem like on, on both sides, people feel the need to harden their hearts in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. and, and, and we're not all pharaohs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I, and, I, and I'm not blaming God. I'm blaming us. I'm blaming us. Because we're not seeing past this. We're not, we're not realizing we're not taking in all this stuff that we did some of this horrible stuff. It's grotesque and grisly and, and unthinkable and inhumane. But, you know, we've never had to answer for our moments of that. You know, we, you do a lot to survive. And I don't excuse us or them at all. Make that clear. But I just know that you, if, if, if Israel... Is, is getting so much from Germany and Jews are moving to Germany rather than stay in Israel. Think about it. These The ancestors of these people tried to exterminate us. So there is a future. What kind is it going to be? Is it going to be Israel and Germany? Or is it going to be what we're seeing right now? If we could heal enough for Israelis to do business with, travel to, and live in Germany. There's got to be a way for us to be able to do all of that and coexist with the Palestinians, with whom we've been fighting for 100 years and who are going to keep fighting for 100 more. On the Palestinian side, if you want to call it that, are there people that you know, you've worked with or encountered who you feel like are partners that you want to have going forward? Definitely, I would definitely. But all that you, we see now are, are the ones who want to kill us because we haven't sought out the ones who want to live with us. 
We're afraid of them because it might look like they're too much like us because the Palestinians I've known and worked with are exactly like us, except they have more PhDs. Mm -hmm. Literally, they have more per PhDs per capita than we do. They're smart. They're enterprising. They're up against, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of hatred, and they've spent years being seen only as terrorists. Now they're being seen as good terrorists by so many young people, including so many judge, ju Jews, Jews who are standing under signs that say "by any means necessary," meaning come and shoot up our babies in their cribs in Stay Road. You're the good terrorists because you're going to liberate the Palestinian people. That's how crazy it's become. And we've let it. We've dehumanized Palestinians. We have refused to humanize, or we don't let them speak in our synagogues. We don't want to hear from them because we might get to know them and we might identify with them and we might imagine a future with them. It's our fault. Not our fault that we're being killed, that we were killed, but it's our fault that we got to this point. To me, it seems so clear. We're paying for not allowing them to become humans and not listening to their side and not understanding their suffering. We're paying for it. That revenge is a powerful force. It breaks through sanity. You you mentioned that you just said, you know, it's it's clear to you, but you know, you're definitely a minority opinion in the American Jewish community. Um I, have you kind of lost friendships or have, have been having arguments about this since October 7th? Some. Yeah. I haven't lost friends because I didn't have <laughs> I didn't have that kind of friends. I didn't have the Ben Gavir supporter type friends. Yeah, but I think there's people kind of in the, you know, muddy yeah, middle who people in people in the in the painful, suffering, agonizing middle. I'm I'm in the middle. I'm just doing the analysis about what happens this way, what happens that way. Um also in progressive circles, you wrote a, I guess a few weeks ago maybe about um how the se the sexual violence has been ignored. Um yeah in progressive circles. Um, how, how, how do you now feel in those circles? I never stop shooting my mouth off about it. And I don't ever let any woman not face head on what she seems to be sanctioning when she doesn't criticize October 7th. I want them all to look at these Me Too loyalists, suddenly have no sympathy, suddenly have no sympathy for the women who's, who, who Hamas shot through the vagina or cut off their breasts. I mean, I want people to engage no matter how, how awful and how they have to put up warning signs and trigger warnings. No trigger warnings. We gotta, we gotta force these people who are ready to ignore rape because they're pro-Palestinian. I mean, that is so reprehensible to me and so contrary to, to, to the femin the promise of feminism. Um, I, I, I will call myself a feminist till my grave because you know, I believe a woman is not a doormat, and therefore I'm a feminist. Um, and I'm a feminist because if you're not, then you, I say to women, give it all back. So I'm, I'm a feminist and will remain one. But I can criticize my own, just like I criticize my own when it comes to Israel. That's I'm not walking, walking uh, closing the door on people that, you know, are my people. And we're in the same struggle, ultimately, but not quite the same way. That's true. Um, let's let's turn to some questions. Um, sure. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, there was, there's been a question about gender and where does gender play into all of this? Um, and is, isn't everyone involved, um, you know, masculine? Aren't we dealing with toxic masculinity? Um, yeah. 
right. Yeah. Alan Alda called it testosterone poisoning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I don't see too many women. Um, I mean, I know the right wing has sort of front, uh, you know, staged, front stage there. Beautiful blonde right wing women anchors on TV and young, uh, tough talking um, right wing women in the Knesset. You know, that's a great tool and they've used it well. They've found women to be spokespeople for what used to be, you know, a real masculine line. You know, if we're going to talk about that, I have to go back to non-sexist trial rearing, which is, you know, has been my rallying cry for, for almost 50 years. If we raise children with sex role stereotypes, you know, mass boys do this, they don't do that. Girls do this, they mustn't do that. If we raise kids like that, we get men who like to shoot and kill and and brazen their way, you know, through a crowd. We get Donald Trump. You know, his father wanted to make him a man, and this is the kind of man he made. Because Donald Trump is always brandishing his masculinity. And that's why being three years younger than Biden, he looks a hundred years older, I mean younger because he's full of masculine bravado. And the men in this country love it because they want it. And they've been told they have to have it. And they identify with Trump. He says very outright, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you. What does that do? It makes every man, you know, a, a macho guy. They're coming after me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna down them. And they're going to have to pay for it. That's the people who wear MAGA hats. You know, they wear a MAGA hat with a tuxedo. They need to wear their masculine, masculinity. If it's not in a shiny car, it's in a MAGA, MAGA hat. And we can't raise those kinds of sons and be surprised <clears throat> when they wage war and when they think war is a solution to a conflict. And do you think there are enough Palestinians who could stand up to Hamas in order to, you know, form not as long better... as Hamas has the guns and the tunnels? No, no, of course not. I mean, look what happened to the Syrians who stood up. You, you can't, you can't. You have to first get rid of an autocrat mm-hmm. uh, before you can stand up, because you, otherwise, it's like a, a shooting gallery. You stand up, bam, down you go. I can't fault weak um, Gazans who have lots of children and no money and living with hemmed in and don't get uh, get aid and don't get supplies and can't feed their children. I can't fault them for not rising up. How are they rising up with what? You know, spin it out. When you spin it out, you, you understand. Would you hazard your family <clears throat> to fight Hamas with the machine guns? And I mean, somewhat related, um, how do you view the people in Gaza who participated in the October 7th massacre? So I think, you know, we're talking about civilians who are not Hamas. But I, I love them. I think they should be tried for what they did. I think they should be lined up in the legal system the way we've lined up the, the marauders at the at the Capitol. I don't think they should be strafed and that fire should fall from the sky and that a mercy, nursing mother should be caught in the crossfire. I don't think that's the way to go. And I don't think it solves anything except breed the next generation who are going to do the same thing. I'd like to leave every person who participated in that October 7th raid, put them in a cage with a poisonous snake and leave them there. Frankly, I'd like to find a torture that I don't have to do myself that could show them what that feels like. But that's not the world we live in. There's not enough poisonous snakes to go around. Do you think that um, more are like Jewish conservatives in, in the United States are using the fear of anti-Semitism 
to create a wedge between progressive Jews Absolutely. and others. Absolutely. I mean, the questioner knows what they're asking, whoever they are. I mean, they might as well have made it a statement. Yes, of course. And it works. It works. And it has worked for years. That's why we stopped doing coalition politics and started doing Israel and anti-Semitism, Israel and anti-Semitism. Because it made us all afraid. And we all want to be the, to be the best Jews. We didn't want to be canceled by our fellow Jews or by Jewish leaders. We didn't want to be called out because, we, I mean, when when Sharon Kleinbaum did a, a, a um, <clears throat> sermon at, uh, at one of the Chagim, uh, one of the Jewish uh, High Holy Days, and spoke about, this was in the uh, way back Gaza war, spoke about how many Jewish children had, uh, how many uh, Palestinian children had been killed. People took their money, funders took their money away from um, the temple Simchat Torah, I think his name. People pulled their money out. They didn't want to hear about Palestinian children. They took their money out, they protested. And, you know, that's who our right wing has um, fueled and what, what our right wing has fueled is that you're with us or against us and there's no gray. And we have to give up empathy and we have to give up our, our you know, bleeding hearts because we have to be tough because everyone's after us. They all want to kill us. <clears throat> who, are, who are other voices like yours um, in the US who people can be following, someone asked? Well, <laughs> Peter Beinart has become radioactive. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever met a more observant Jew, a more moral Jew. Um, I I happen to disagree with him. He he does not consider himself a feminist any a uh, feminist. He's still a feminist, a Zionist anymore. I think that's throwing the towel in. Um, I understand why he felt he had to do that because he he's gotten so deep into this issue that he had to do something. To be, to give up on what this the current government is doing, he had to do something. So did a, a Avram Berg in Israel, who was speaker of the Knesset, left, get, th threw away his credentials as an Israeli, his credentials as a Jew, because he couldn't stand living under the the, the rulers, the, the people ruling Israel. I mean, these are people. You know, they're martyrs. They're our, to me, they're our martyrs. I'm not them. Mm -hmm. But I know what, what they're trying to do. I know they're sacrificing their legitimacy in the Jewish community. They're letting themselves be kicked out of the tent rather than live with what's happening inside the tent. You know, if you're conscience bound, what do you, maybe that's what, what you have to do. Um, and then someone else asked um, who, are there Israeli organizations or partners that also think like you? Someone suggested the New Israel Fund. Someone suggested um, Women of the Wall. Yeah, New Israel Fund, Women of the Wall, Combatants for Peace, Peace Now, <clears throat> um, the Kitchen Table Women who are trying to demilitarize or de, de I don't know what the word is, to get rid of all the, the high degree of, of uh, people walking around with arms and bringing them into the home, at which increases domestic violence. The kitchen table women are protesting that. Israelis aren't paying attention to the rise in the domestic violence rates there, but they're definitely um, a byproduct of the of the violence that's, that's everyday life now. Um, you know, forced on us, yes, but existed before October 7th. Um, and I see actually from five different people, which maybe shows what American Jews are thinking, you know, the question of how do you negotiate with people or an entity that only want to kill you or see your destruction? Yeah, you don't, you don't not uh, negotiate with Hamas killers. You find, you, you support, you break bread with your, the members of the enemy group who are still human beings. And that's most of them. But 
we've, as I've said, we've never invited them into our spaces. You know, there are people working with um, Eretz Lechulam, a land for all. Palestinians working with, do, do we ever invite them anywhere to hear? There are Palestinians and Israelis working together for to, to bring about confederation, to make people understand there is an alternative, a workable two-state alternative. The old two-state alternative was a mess. This one has taken into consideration the dignity of another people, as well as you know who gets what. I think that you know they exist. We need to forefront them. We need to find them and forefront them, and support them because <clears throat> the BDS movement has has cr almost criminalized normalization. Normalization it makes you a traitor, according to. Um, PBS, uh, P, uh, BD, the, BD, the, the framer of the BDS, um, say, you know, constitution or whatever they call it. Normalization means dialogue. Normalization means student exchange. New, normalization is uh, inviting people into your mosque, uh, your synagogue, and you go into their mosques. They don't want that because it postpones the revolution. And I always say that reminds me of someone in my husband's hometown, which was a utopian town called Roosevelt, New Jersey, full of radicals, full of old commies and socialists and so on, who argued into the night, you know, and never noticed it was New Year's Eve, you know, just kept arguing. And the, one of one couple that I met there said, I never give to a beggar. I was so shocked. Why would you never give to a beggar? Because it postpones the revolution, they said. In other words, there need to be a lot of beggars before the whole country will wake up to poverty. Now, how crazy is that one? But that's kind of the same situation, you know? I won't sit down with them because, you know, they, people have to see that they're killers. People have to believe that they're all terrorists. So I'm not sitting down with them. And on the Palestinian side, the anti-normalization is the same thing. We don't want anybody to see you can work together. Because that's the end of a Palestinian uh, takeover of the whole st whole thing. You have to decode all of this. You know, it's not just a label you slap on so someone. Um, and I just also wanted to say, there's also a lot of comments on the other side with people saying, you know, Letty, you're voicing everything that I've been distraught about these past several weeks. Or um, I'm aghast at the utter lack of empathy among the Jewish community. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point out there's definitely feelings in, in both directions. I know there is. I know we're all caught on the caught on the horns of a dilemma. The thing is not to be run over by the bull. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe last question. Um, well, there are a few questions about anti-Semitism today. You know, how are we supposed to react to that in light of everything? Or someone asked, you know, what do we say to our grandchildren who are experiencing anti-Semitism now? Well, I have grandchildren who are, who are. Um, I just want to write down that bull metaphor. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to forget it. Um, I have good grandchildren. I have, I have a granddaughter in, at Stanford Law School and a grandson at Columbia Law School and an engineering graduate student at Tufts. So it's a normal Jewish family, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're feeling it. Um, and they're trying to keep open a dialogue. They're trying to talk. They're trying to, you know, not, not turn away, um, not give up. One of them is, is attempting to get a, a conference started on just war theory, mm -hmm. you know, just to talk about the issues of pro proportionality. It's hard to do that on a campus that, you know, explodes anytime anyone on either side gets elevated into a, to a, to a podium. Things are so hor hor horrific now in terms of inability to listen yeah. and in terms of you know if you're not on our side you're you're the devil oh. so 
in a way, you know, BDS is really, and that thesis and that philosophy is is the winner. Mm -hmm. The yeah. rise of security tests in a way. Yeah. Letting the normalization that would allow us to move on and coexist and recognize the dignity and humanity of the other. They're shutting that down. Uh, well, our our last question. I mean, is is there any message of hope you can you can share for you know the 160 people on here? Yeah, the hope I find is in in the fact that there are still people working for human rights and for peace, and who are, haven't just thrown in the towel and said it's you know it's never going to happen. They're still out there. Women wait. Women waging peace is that the name of that group yeah women I think waging, so, yeah. yeah yeah women waging peace they made a, a huge parade i think they marched from somewhere to jerusalem or around jerusalem, jerusalem a few years ago i remember the sight of them all it was awesome there were you know israeli women in in hip huggers and and cutoffs and there were palestinian women in hijabs and you know black shadows um and they were side by side because they were waging peace. And, and it was a great inspiration. But, you know, they were just women or they were naive or everybody, you know, saw what happened and we have to, Israel has the right to defend itself. You know, it, it, it's, it's like being on a hamster wheel. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you, Letty, very much. I think thank everyone learned a lot. Thank you this moment of this soapbox. Because, you know, I'm all pent up myself. And uh, I'm a writer and I, I, I have a sick husband and I'm not able to write right now. So it, it has given me an opportunity to speak my views instead of write them. And thank you very much for so many people tuning in. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, and be sure to sign up next week for um, Ida Prince Gibson's uh, talk about what winning actually means in this oh, war. That's great. That's great.